Over at Breitbart, our buddy Joel Pollack, on this issue of apartheid, he points out the history of the false analogy between apartheid and Israel is a dismal one. It was promoted by the Soviet Union in the 1970s as a way to isolate Israel and cultivate communist allies in the Arab world. This was the era of the infamous Zionism is racism UN resolution rescinded in 1991 and the effort to associate Israel with apartheid and colonization was a systematic one aimed at harming not only Israel but also the United States. Among the first to use the analogy at the UN was Idi Amin, the bloody dictator of Uganda who compared Israel to apartheid South Africa in a speech to the UN General Assembly. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the American ambassador to the UN at the time, recognized the Soviet-backed effort was a direct threat to American strategic interests and marshaled the support of the Ford administration to come to Israel's defense. And ladies and gentlemen, is this not what we're talking about? America's strategic interests? We treat our closest allies this way? The apartheid analogy was revived in 2001 in the run-up to the UN World Conference Against Racism in South Africa, city of Durban. That conference collapsed into an, uh, a festival of anti-Semitic hatred, with activists disseminating cartoons featuring crude Jewish stereotypes and breaking up meetings held by Jewish organizations. The Obama administration tried to revive sequels to this Durban meeting, but soon abandoned the effort. For the past 13 years, activists have persisted in their use of the apartheid analogy and received a boost in 2007 from former President Jimmy Carter with his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. The book roundly condemned for its apparent defense of suicide bombing, for which Carter later apologized, gave the analogy a legitimacy it did not deserve. The Carter's own standing within his Democrat Party declined somewhat. But it's back. Those who actually know what apartheid was, however, have continued to resist the use of the term. And Joe Pollack, by the way, was raised in South Africa. Benjamin Pogrund, for example, a path-breaking South African journalist, widely considered a hero of the anti-apartheid struggle, has since moved to Israel and worked on reconciliation efforts between Israelis and Palestinians. And he debunked this analogy. He said apartheid comes easily to hand. It is a lazy label for the complexities of the Middle East conflict. It is also used because if it can be made to stick, then Israel can be made to appear to be a vile or a vile country, as was apartheid in South Africa, and seeking its destruction can be presented to the world as an equally moral cause. This is what John Kerry did, which no former Secretary of State has ever done. And apart from that, you really have to, in your heart and in your soul, have nothing but contempt for this tiny little country and its Jewish population to speak as he spoke. Now I want to remind you that this administration is full, is full of individuals of this kind, starting at the top. Starting at the top. And it should concern all of us. And as I did some of my research in preparation for this show, October 27, 2008, National Review Online, our buddy Andy McCarthy, former federal prosecutor of terrorists, among others. And in this piece, he reminded us of a fellow by the name of Khalidi, Rashid Khalidi. He said, why is the Los Angeles Times sitting on a videotape of the 2003 Farrell Bash in Chicago at which Barack Obama lavished praise on the guest of honor Rashid Khalidi, former mouthpiece for master terrorist Yasser Arafat? Things will start to come together if you listen to me the next 
hour or so. At the time, Khalidi, a PLO advisor turned University of Chicago professor, was headed east to Columbia. There he would take over the university's Middle East Studies program, which has since maintained as a bubbling cauldron of anti-Semitism, writes McCarthy, and assumed the professorship in down in honor of Edward Syed, another notorious terror apologist. These are Obama's friends. The party featured many of Khalidi's allies, colleagues, and friends, including Barack Obama, then an Illinois state senator, and Bill Ayers, the terrorist-turned-education professor. It was sponsored by the Arab American Action Network, AAAN, which had been founded by Khalidi and his wife Mona, formerly a top English translator for Arafat's press agency. Gateway Pundit at the time reports that the Los Angeles Times has the videotape, but is suppressing it. Back in April, the Times, this is why I call the media Obama's Praetorian Guard, protecting him. Back in April, and this is again 2008, the Times published a gentle story. Reporter Peter Walston avoided, for example, any mention of the inconvenient fact that the revelers at this party, including Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, Ayers' wife, and fellow weatherman terrorist. These self-professed revolutionary leftists are friendly with both Obama and Khalidi. Indeed, researcher Stanley Kurtz has noted that Ayers and Khalidi were best friends. And small world. Turns out the Obamas are extremely close to the Khalidis, who have uh, reportedly babysat Obama's children. The mouthpiece for Hamas. The mouthpiece, I should say, for Arafat, the PLO. Nor did the LA Times report the party was thrown by this organization, AAAN. Wollaston does tell us that the group received grants from the Leftist Woods Fund when Obama was on its board. But besides understating the amount, it was 75000 not 40000 The LA Times mentions neither that Ayers was also on the Woods board at the time, nor that the group is rabidly anti-Israel. And perhaps even more inconveniently, the LA Times also let slip that it had obtained a videotape of this going-away party for Khalidi, at which Ayers and Dorn and Obama were all in attendance. Can you imagine being in that room, folks? Would you be? No. Now, Wallace's L.A. Times story is worth excerpting a little bit. Here's what he wrote in the L.A. Times about the man who would become our president. It was a celebration of Palestinian culture, a night of music, dancing, and a dash of politics. Local Arab Americans were bidding farewell to Rashid Khalidi, remember who he is, an internationally known scholar, critic of Israel, an advocate for Palestinian rights, who was leaving town for a job in New York. A special tribute came from Khalidi's friend and frequent dinner companion, the young state senator Barack Obama. And speaking to the crowd, Obama reminisced about meals prepared by Khalidi's wife Mona in conversations that had challenged his thinking. His many talks with the Khalidis, Obama said, had been consistent reminders to me of my own blind spots and my own biases. It's for that reason that I'm hoping that for many years to come we continue that conversation. A conversation that is necessary not just around Moda and Rashid's dinner table, but around this entire world. I want to remind you who Obama is. The L.A. Slimes piece continues. The warm embrace Obama gave to Khalidi and words like those at the professor's going away party have left some Palestinian-American leaders believing Obama is more receptive to their viewpoint than he is willing to say. Their belief is not drawn from Obama's speeches or campaign literature, but from comments that some say Obama made in private, and from his association with the Palestinian-American community in his hometown of Chicago, including his presence at events where anger at Israeli and U.S. Middle East policy was freely expressed. These are radical leftists. You see, they hate America, and they hate Israel among others. At Khalidi's 2003 farewell party, for example, a young Palestinian-American recited a poem accusing the Israeli government of terrorism in the treatment of Palestinians and sharply criticizing U.S. support of Israel. 
If Palestinians cannot secure their own land, she said, then you will never see a day of peace. One speaker likened Zionist settlers on the West Bank to Osama bin Laden, saying both have been blinded by ideology. Obama adopted a different tone in his comments and called for finding common ground, but his presence at such events, as he worked to build a political base in Chicago, has led some Palestinian leaders to believe he might deal differently with the Middle East than his opponents for the White House. At Khalidi's going away party in 2003, the scholar lavished praise on Obama, telling the mostly Palestinian-American crowd that the state senator deserved their help in winning a U.S. Senate seat. You will not have a better senator under any circumstances, Khalidi said. Listen to this. The event was videotaped, and a copy of the tape was obtained by the L.A. Times. This is in the story. And the L.A. Times would never release that tape. The Praetorian media protecting their man. So why is the Times sitting on the videotape of the Khalidi festivities? Why won't the Times tell us what was said in the various Khalidi testimonials? On that score, Ayers and Dorn have always had characteristically noxious views on the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. And true to form, they've always been quite open about them. There's no reason to believe their views have ever changed. What of Obama's? And there's more. Bringing us up the speed. February 5th of this year, the Washington Free Beacon, a senior member of the Muslim Brotherhood, was recently hosted at the White House for a meeting with President Barack Obama prompting an outcry from critics of the global Islamist organization. It's a terrorist organization. Anas Al-Tikridi, a top British lobbyist for the Muslim Brotherhood, whose father heads Iraq's Muslim Brotherhood party, recently met with the president and vice president Joe Biden as part of a delegation discussing problems in Iraq. al Al-Tikridi, or whatever the hell, a top uh, whose work has uh, also been tied to Hamas can be seen smiling in photos published by the White House as he stands next to the Iraqi Parliament Speaker. The meeting was first, at, oh, uh, and shaking hands with Obama in the White House's Roosevelt Room. The Obama administration has been criticized for its outreach to the Muslim Brotherhood, the international Islamist organizations whose members briefly reigned in Egypt, and who was supported by the White House. Al-Takridi and other members of the Iraqi delegation were in town to discuss al-Qaeda's growing presence in Iraq. President Obama, okay, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. And it goes on about this guy. And I got to thinking, and Obama has populated this administration with like-minded people. John Kerry can talk all he wants about what he did as one of 100 senators, but he's one of one secretaries of state. Now, I'm not done exposing this crowd, this gaggle of Israel haters, collection of anti-Semites. I'm not done. And I'm going to continue through this. I'm going to deal with Chuck Hagel, and I'm going to deal with this Samantha Power. And then I'm going to wrap it all together with a nice bow. Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel was confirmed for Secretary of Defense, despite the fact he's dumber than a doorknob, and some other matters. Obama selected one of the few anti-Israel senators. Not Republicans, Democrats, one of the few with a long record of such in the United States Senate. And as DeRoy Murdoch pointed out in a column about a year ago, Hegel tried to close the USO's Haifa Israel retreat when he ran the United Service Organization from 1987 to 1990. The facility was highly popular among U.S. sailors, rather. 45,000 of whom visited the Israeli port in 1990 alone, according to the Associated Press. Chuck Hagel said the Haifa port is costing the U.S. too much and that if the Jews wanted to have one, the Jews should do the funding. 
reported the Washington Free Beacon. He said to me, an individual said, let the Jews pay for it. Actually, the individual was Marsha Haldeman, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. I told him at the time that I found his comments to be anti-Semitic. He was playing into the dual loyalty thing. Hegel was one of only four senators who refused to sign a Senate letter supporting Israel during Yasser Arafat's terrorist intifada in 2000. The State Department has become adjunct to the Israeli Foreign Minister's Office, Hegel reportedly remarked in a speech at Rutgers University in March 2007. I'm not reading you all these, I'm just picking a few. And they're not even the worst, they're just among the shortest examples. I'm a U.S. Senator, Hegel declared in 2008. I'm not an Israeli Senator. Now, we know that, folks, but that's what people say, or guys like him say, which is utterly inappropriate. We believe that when Senator Hegel said that he was not an Israeli Senator, that he was a U.S. Senator, he strongly implied some of his colleagues have a greater loyalty to Israel than the United States. That crosses the line said Rabbi Marvin Heyer, founder of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And he goes on, bullet after bullet after bullet. That's the Secretary of Defense. Now, the ambassador to the United Nations that Obama picked is a radical leftist. And um, in 2002, and I'm wrapping this up, she... uh, she made a statement on television. I want you to listen to this. You need to turn up the volume. Just listen to what she says. It's about two-thirds of the way in. Cut 12, go. Hello, I cut 12. In, in the Palestine-Israeli situation, there's an abundance of information, and what, what we don't need is some kind of early warning um, mechanism there. What we need is a willingness to actually put something on the line in service of helping the situation. And putting something on the line might mean alienating uh, a domestic constituency of <laughs> tremendous uh, political and financial import. Jews. Oh, um, stop. It, you know, the Jews. The money changers. Tremendous political and financial import. But what she doesn't understand, and many of us do, is that 70% of the Jewish vote goes to a Democrat, no matter how hostile that Democrat is to Jews, which we've talked about at length before. Go ahead. More crucially, mean sacrificing or, or uh, investing. I think more than sacrificing, um, literally billions of dollars, not in servicing Israelis, uh, you know, military, but actually in investing in the new state of Palestine, in investing billions of dollars. It would probably take also to support. Uh, I think what will have to be a mammoth uh, protection force, uh, not of the old, you know, Srebrenica kind or the Rwanda kind, mm-hmm. but a meaningful military presence. Because it seems to me at this stage, and this is true of, of actual genocides as well, and not just you know, major human rights abuses. Stop, 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 stop. You see all the all little flags popping up here. This is her mentality. You see, folks, we need a big military presence there, we, the United States, so we don't have actual genocides. You know, by Israel. She doesn't mean by the Palestinians. This is our secretary to the United Nations. This is a brief, this is the life of the administration review. Obama at the top, the secretary of defense, the ambassador to the UN, the clown at the State Department, all of them. And there are more, Valerie Jarrett and so forth and so on. This line that Kerry put out there, it it is amazing, this administration. It's not just with respect to Israel or foreign policy, but domestic policy, too. They make truly disgusting and outrageous comments. And then they pretend to walk them back and apologize when, in fact, they double down. Anybody who dares question John Kerry's 30-year record in the Senate, I'll question it, you jerk as well as your military record, as well as the whole damn thing. Proof is in the pudding, as they say. 
Look how quickly this issue is whitewashed. Look how quickly this issue is eliminated. We'll be asking the damn NBA tomorrow, won't we? All over radio, all over TV. But John Kerry, not a word, not a blip on the radar. Meanwhile, where's Obama? Mr. Producer, find his schedule. We always look at it every day. Where's Obama today? He hasn't said a damn thing. Not one word. The NBA commissioner, like him or not, like what he did or not, he's already acted. Took him 72 hours. Obama. Benghazi happens. He's missing. Eight or ten hours. Where the hell did he go? He's never been asked about it. Never been held to account for it. Four people dead at Benghazi. And the media are more excited, and I don't mean in a happy way, I mean in a journalistic way, about this NBA doofus than they are in finding out how four Americans, including a U.S. ambassador, was murdered. It's stunning, is it not? 